French illustrator Adrien Barreur was born in 1877 in Paris as Adrien Bonheur. When and why he changed his name isn't known. It wasn't until after he'd studied both law and medicine that he decided neither profession appealed to him and he would rather work as a humorous illustrator and caricaturist. Even while studying, he had created a few popular humorous pictures, including a large image featuring caricatures of the faculty members of the medical school in Paris, and another similar image of the law professors he studied under. So he was already 32 years old before he really began an illustration career in 1906. In that year, the Parisian magazine Fantasia was launched, and Barre's drawings were featured from the first issue onward. And in addition to his magazine work, he became professionally associated with the creation of posters for both theatrical and silent movie productions. Among his more memorable and distinctive theatre posters were those he created for the Grand Guignol Theatre in Paris. The many bloodthirsty melodramas this company staged were particularly popular with French audiences with a taste for the horrific and Barrère's gloriously gory posters enticed many in to watch the show, or as much of it as their stomach and nerves could stand. He also had regular commissions from the filmmakers Pathé. They were responsible for most of the silent motion pictures shown in France in this period, and Barrère was considered the ideal choice for many of the comedies they released. And he illustrated the work of author and dramatist Georges Courteline, who was highly popular in France at that time. Barret had the misfortune to suffer from a rare form of tuberculosis, which made him ineligible to fight for his country in the Great War. But he used his talents to create propaganda for the French war effort, and despite his disability, he travelled deep into the combat zones and trenches to make journalistic drawings of French troops. Many of these were collected and published once the war had ended, he resumed normal commercial work and was particularly successful with his series of caricatures of French actors and other celebrities. He also created political illustrations, including some dramatic anti-communist propaganda in the wake of the Russian Revolution. Throughout the 1920s, Barrère continued to enjoy popularity and commercial success, and he would in all probability have continued along similar lines into the next decade, but given his late start, his career proved even shorter than expected when he succumbed to his lifelong illness and died at the age of only 54 in 1931. I'm fairly certain that the name Harold Gaze won't be familiar to the great majority of viewers. It certainly wasn't familiar to me. And yet his enchanting fantasy work is easily the equal of any of the more familiar names of Golden Age children's illustration. The few lines of biography I've scraped together are full of holes and probably inaccurate, but I'll do my best with what I've got and hope that his marvellous illustrations make up for the narration. He was born in New Zealand in 1885, but at 18 in 1903 he left for London where he attended art school. So, assuming he spent three years studying, he would have finished art school in 1906 or 7. But the earliest dated image I've found is from 1914, so that's seven years unaccounted for. In 1917, he resurfaced in New York when his illustrations were published in Rose Stronghubble's children's book, If I Could Fly. Not long after, he left New York for Australia in 1918 and began writing books of his own. The first was The Wicked Winkapong, which unfortunately seems to have sunk without trace. But in 1920, his story about the adventures of the red-haired girl Coppertop appeared, and soon after it was published, he headed for London, where he illustrated another six books. Among these was The Goblin's Glen in 1924, and a series of other highly surreal stories and collections with odd titles based on fantasy creatures such as the Chugum Blugum and the simple Jagger Jay. What Gaze appeared to have had no desire to do was work on the classics such as Hans Christian Andersen or the Brothers Grimm, or maybe he just wasn't offered the work. Gaze's pen and ink drawings were precise and expressive, although he didn't create many as monochromes. 
It was the precision of the line enhanced by the equal precision of his tonal use of watercolour which defined virtually all his output and made it such a delight to look at. In 1927 he moved yet again, this time to Pasadena, California. Some of the patently unreliable sources I've used claim Gay's work for Disney at this time and that this image was used as the basis for a scene in a Silly Symphony's animation. And I can verify that it was concept art for Disney, but I'm far from convinced that this really is the work of Harold Gaze. In 1931, he illustrated the Wonder World fairy tale book, written by Gwen Bourne. And although there are later images dating up to 1957, I don't know what books they were for. Among these is a collection of breathtaking fantasy illustrations, which weren't for the young at all. They were a long way from pornographic, even by the standards of the day, but they featured dainty female nudes in various environments, rendered with the same pictorial delicacy and exquisite detail as was found in his children's work. An auction site I found refers to them as book illustrations, but neglects to tell us the title. And the individual images are dated between 1940 and 1947, so they can't have been for the same book. And the only other scrap of information I found is that Gaze returned to England in 1959 and he died there in 1963, already virtually forgotten. I have to admit that for many American viewers at least, comic artist George Herriman struggles to qualify as unsung. Even so, neither Herriman or his creation Crazy Cat get anything like the credit they deserve, so he's included. He was born in New Orleans in 1880 and was ethnically speaking Creole. This was no time to be of mixed race if he wanted to get on in life, but he was light-skinned and successfully kept his racial origins secret. Some of his earliest comic strips even made fun of black Americans, but in the early 20th century this was nothing exceptional. Herriman's family moved to Los Angeles when he was 10 and he later studied at St. Vincent's College. After graduation, he briefly became a sketch artist at the Los Angeles Herald, but in 1900, at the age of 20, he moved to New York to work for Judge magazine. He was determined to succeed with a comic strip, and he created many over the next decade, but most of them only lasted a few months or even less. The longest lived of these was Major Ozone's Fresh Air Crusade, which managed a two-year run, but it wasn't the success he had hoped for. Around this time, he was lucky enough to meet the publishing tycoon William Randolph Hearst, who really liked his work and became Herriman's effective patron. The Dingbat family, which ran between 1910 and 1916, was Herriman's first comic outing for the Hearst Empire. The strip featured an anonymous cat and mouse in a supporting role, and they were used as the basis for the spin-off Crazy Cat in 1913. The weird premise of the strip is that Crazy is hopelessly in love with Ignatz the mouse. But Ignatz dislikes Crazy and is fond of hurling bricks at the cat's head. Officer Pup, the policeman, attempts with variable success to put the mouse in jail. And from this most basic of concepts, Herriman created any number of bizarre stories with many peculiar unexpected twists and turns. It was the persistence of Herriman's visual imagination which made the strip unique. The layout and structure varied constantly, and within individual strips there was colossal creative energy and visual mischief. The backgrounds changed even when the characters hadn't moved, and the frequently unsettling world they inhabited predated the surrealist art movement by the best part of a decade. There were numerous failed attempts to adapt Crazy Cat into animation, but from the first attempt onward, nobody could capture the artfully scribbled styling of the strip or its gloriously offbeat humour. Crazy Cat never achieved the popularity more mainstream strips of the period had, but Hearst loved it unconditionally, and he personally saw to it that Herriman was very well paid and had total control over his creation. Despite this security, Herriman continued to try out new ideas, and some even managed to run for two or three years, but none of them had the undefinable magical quality of Crazy Cat. 
The final decades of his life were plagued by illness and tragedy. He suffered from crippling arthritis and in 1931 his wife died in a car accident. Eight years later his daughter died at the age of 32. Crazy Cat had run almost uninterrupted for 31 years until Harriman's own death in 1944. His legacy to the world of comics simply can't be overstated. When I was growing up in 1950s Britain, the illustrations of Eric Fraser were just about everywhere. I really didn't like them, but then I didn't like anything that wasn't a cartoon or a comic. As an adult, all these years later, I realised just how important Fraser was to the development of modern British illustration, even if he's still not one of my favourites. He was born in London in 1902, and in 1919, he won a scholarship to Goldsmiths School of Art. Once he had graduated, he did some part-time teaching there, while trying to get established as an illustrator. In 1926, he was given his first commission for the Radio Times, and this was to prove pivotal to his career. Not only would they remain a regular client for the rest of his life, but the very public profile it gave him led to other clients and commissions. In the later 1920s, the Art Deco style poster work he created for London Transport, among others, gave his career an additional boost. And he developed a strong relationship with the magazine Lilliput, who provided him with almost as much work as the Radio Times. Although he used a range of techniques and styles, his work was usually informed by traditional printing methods, such as woodcuts, aquatints and hand lithography. Apparently he was frequently emulating these processes with drawn and painted media, but however they had been arrived at, the frequent collision of traditional and modernist disciplines gave his work a distinctive and dynamic appeal. During the Second World War he was too old to fight, so he stayed in England and joined the Civil Guard, and he continued to illustrate if only at a much reduced rate. But in the years following the end of the war, he was increasingly being commissioned for book work. He was in demand to decorate the pages of several worthy classical volumes, such as an edition of the romantic verses of the Roman poet Ovid. But more frequently, it was the design and illustration of book covers which dominated his output. He created dozens of covers over the coming years, covering pretty much all genres of fact and fiction. And in these commissions, he was able to explore and demonstrate the diversity and breadth of his stylistic approaches. And although he had become best known for his monochrome work, these consistently compelling images showed what he was capable of with the use of tastefully selected colour. In addition to his work in publishing, he was also kept busy creating posters, press advertisements and all manner of illustrated material for a wide range of clients, including several commissions from the post office. Eric Fraser continued working into the later 1970s and he died in 1983 at the age of 81 with a large and influential body of work to his credit. And that's another four off my list and there'll be more along next time. See you then.